Hello friends, welcome back to another video, and welcome to the channel where for the entire month of June we're going to be focusing on queer authors for Pride Month. And the book that we're focusing on today is actually one that was recommended to me by my lovely friend Laurel, just another creator in the world of YouTube, but she recommended that I read A Wild and Precious Life by Eddie Windsor. This book is a memoir, it's talking about gay life in the 50s and 60s, specifically in New York, which I feel like I just recently was reading about that time period when I was doing the Maddie Healy video and I was reading all these things from the Beat Generation. But I'm interested to see this very specific time period with this very specific conversation, and from somebody who knew so much about it at the time. Windsor was a marriage equality icon for the gay rights movement. She was a longtime activist, and this book came out a couple of years ago. It's co-written. She wrote it until her unfortunate passing in 2017, and then it was wrapped up by somebody named Joshua Leon. I will say, I was very intimidated to pick this up when I saw it. First of all, because Laurel reads a lot of historical books, and I'm so scared of nonfiction. But memoirs are the easiest to consume for me at least. And this is a topic that I really wish I knew more about, so I think it's time we at least can give it a try. I'm just gonna get it on my Kindle and we're gonna- we're gonna do our best here. I'm asking that you please be kind to me because there are for sure gonna be things that I miss or things that I under-explain, things that I just completely get wrong, or things that I just don't express in the way that the person who experienced the life would be able to tell you. Because this is a memoir, it's coming from a person who lived these experiences, so I 100% encourage if you are able to read this book for yourself, because I'm not gonna explain it in as good of a way as she would have. As with the other memoirs that I've read this month, this is gonna be a lot more summary based than opinion based. So with some of my fiction reading vlogs, I'll talk about the plot or I'll talk about the writing style or things I did and didn't like about the way that it goes, but when I'm reading nonfiction, there's not that much I can say about how it goes. It's just gonna play out how it plays out and these people are just choosing to tell those parts of the story. So instead of talking about the writing style and anything like that, I'm gonna try my best to summarize. So I'll read a couple of chapters and then I'll tell you what goes on in them. The point with this video is more to educate and more to keep the information in this book circulating. Because with people in power trying so hard to silence queer voices, I feel like it's really important that we continue talking about these stories. Again, I am 1000% recommending if any of you are able to read this book on your own, please do. But with that being said, I'm gonna go buy it, I'm gonna go start it, and I'm gonna hope that it's not too intimidating. You all are very kind and we all understand what's going on here. We're doing our best to educate ourselves. There's gonna be mistakes, there's gonna be weird confusion, but we're all just gonna try our best to be one step better. Let's get into it. Hello friends, this is actually the next night and this update is very very frustrating to me because last night when I started reading this book I recorded an update for the first couple of chapters. I went through each chapter, I talked about what happened in them, but it was 17 minutes long and it just felt really stressful the whole time because I didn't know if I was hitting all the points, I didn't know if I was saying it in the way that made sense, and also in a way that was true to what the author was trying to put out. And also there are a lot more chapters in this book than there were in the other memoirs that I've been reading and it would just be so much to sit down and try and talk about about each one because there's 23 I think so I'd be here for a while and the whole time I'd be stressing about if I'm hitting each detail of the chapters so instead we're gonna do this in sections I'm not gonna specify this is this chapter this chapter this chapter I'm just gonna give you a broad overview of what each of the chapters have here's what I got from chapters one to four before that it does have a little bit of a prelude a little bit of an intro where Joshua Leon the person who co-wrote this book talks about how he got in on this project how he started working and writing for this book he talks about his interactions with her they were working together for pretty much the entire writing process and then she passed away really really close to when they were finished so Joshua made the decision to not only make it just a memoir talking about her memories but to go around asking other people who knew her at different times in her life and get their stories so it's mostly a memoir but kind of a biography because you're getting this outside information from people and how they saw her it was just a nice little introduction to see that there's somebody working on this book who also cared about it as much as this person did they both understood this similar goal of getting the story out to other people. It just feels good to read, to know that everybody who worked on it did care about it. I think this whole section kind of revolves around her early years, so like all throughout school. In the first chapter you get introduced to her mom, who was a Jewish immigrant. When she first moved to this country, she was very much pushed to find a husband because she needed to marry into a wealthy family in order to take care of her own. They expected her at a very young age to move to this country and to find somewhere that they could all rely on. And this translated into how Eddie's mother treated all of her kids. She had three kids and the expectation was 
almost that they would marry into wealthy families and they would kind of keep this alive. They would keep working hard for everything, but also they would sell themselves into good families to make sure that they were taken care of. They grew up on top of a little ice cream, soda, candy shop that the mom was running and they got kicked out in fourth grade. They lost the store, which also means they lost their house, but they moved somewhere else and they did small little jobs to keep things going to make sure they had enough money. Eddie emphasizes that she didn't recognize how much or how little they had. She was just living her life. And because her family was very much focused on putting out these treats, she was living the ideal childhood dream, you know? Like she was not worried about a lot that was going on, which World War II was starting at this time. So as a child, you're just kind of moving through life. You don't understand the severity of the situation. She said that she was spoiled, all of her siblings were, but the gifts I was showered with and held onto were self-esteem and a belief that I could do anything. And I feel like that really shows how family influences affect such strong voices and such powerful people in our community because the same thing was true with All Boys Aren't Blue where they talk about how their grandmother pushed so hard to be kind and to work hard and all of these really strong core values that translate into how these people project their own voices. It's just really nice to see supportive families that push their children out to do these incredible things for everybody else. Her sister secretly got married, the boyfriend, now husband, moved into the house. Around this time the war was picking up and soldiers were steadily moving through the neighborhood. People getting sent off, people coming back. Every time that somebody came back there was a celebration until one time somebody didn't come back at which point the celebrations got so much bigger because they realized that that's possible so you have to make every moment count. She made it to high school at which point she didn't really understand or have any attraction towards women. She just went along with what she knew and boys were into her. She knew what clothing was flattering, she knew how to talk to everybody but she also had really high standards and her family also did. They were pretty protective of her, they wanted somebody who was wealthy and who was pretty and who could take care of her. She said she liked dating for the attention and she enjoyed being wanted more than the actual touching, more than the actual interactions that were going on. She just liked that people wanted her. Around this time she met a guy named Benjamin, he was wealthy, he was attractive, it was everything that they needed, but she set a boundary, she said that she was too young and she was not into that so they called it off. She started smoking, which is a habit that followed her for a majority of her life. It's again brought up that she was blissfully ignorant about the war. She didn't understand how terrible things were getting. Keep in mind, she is Jewish. Her family is Jewish. That would be so disorienting to look back on and to realize how much was going on that you just weren't connected to because you weren't old enough to understand it. She was always incredibly smart at school, specifically in math. She was really, really good at solving these logic problems. But once she hit college, her excitement for both boys and school died down a little bit. Her college experience was significantly less exciting because with so many guys coming back from the war, they were all young guys who didn't really have time to have an education. They needed to open up more schools. So her college ended up being at her high school. She ended up just being stuck in the same place. There's just not a lot of change. And that made it really hard to stay motivated and to stay interested in any of these topics because it just feels like forever. <laughs> And she also was less interested in guys at the time. This was her first time seeing a lesbian couple just out and about. And it was the first time that she became aware of physical attraction to women when she was playing tennis. She decided to join the team, not because she had an interest in sports, but just because activity is good. She needed something to do. She was not that great at it, but she kept bumping into one of her teammates. They would go back and forth, knocking into each other. And eventually she said, if you do that again, I'm going to kiss you on the mouth. And the other girl said, really? <laughs> but obviously that's something that wasn't really acceptable and they didn't know where you could go to do something like that. So Eddie very bravely walks up to this queer couple. She walks up to these two lesbians and says, hey, do you know anywhere that two ladies could get a moment of privacy? They very quickly realize that it's just another baby gay and they decide to offer their studio apartment. They have a brief little thing. It doesn't last super long because the other person in the relationship was keeping a diary where she wrote about her feelings, not explicitly, but enough that when somebody read it, they decided that the feelings were too much. It got around to the school, which got around to the moms, and they said, hey, you guys can't be together anymore. Eddie wasn't really looking for an identity. She wasn't actively thinking about the word lesbian or identifying with that at all. She was just experiencing these new feelings. Over the summer, she decided to move to Atlantic City to find a job, so she moved into an apartment with some friends, and she also got accepted to Temple University, where she focused on liberal arts, but specifically psychology, because she wanted to figure out why she has these homosexual attractions. She wanted to know why she's having these feelings for girls, and is there a way to stop it, but at the time there wasn't really much interest or information about it. She briefly dated one of her brother's friends, but ultimately it was too alcohol focused, they were drinking a lot. She had a little bit too much and decided that that is not the life for her. While she's in this new place working as a hotel valet parking cars and then eventually a waitress, she meets this group of people on the beach, one of them being Caroline who is her first real true love, and the next summer they move in together. It's her and a couple other people, but they were roommates. Yeah, they were roommates. 
we get it. <laughs> Both of them had boyfriends at the time, so nobody was really suspecting that there was anything else going on. The only issue with this is that there were no queer celebrities to look up to, and there was also nobody in her life that was accepting of this type of behavior, so she was very isolated. She couldn't talk to anybody about her relationship or her feelings or anything to go along with that. She very much carried the weight of all of this alone. And it eventually led to her giving up on the whole relationship. She broke up with her boyfriend, and she also broke up with Caroline, the girlfriend, because it was just too much of a secret, and she would rather be true to herself by cutting out that side completely. So she went back to the safety of a relationship with her brother's friend, Saul, and they ended up getting married. It's also worth mentioning that Caroline, the girlfriend, stayed with her boyfriend. She said, what other option is there? This is just the life that you have. That comes up later. When she got married to this guy, she did make one boundary for herself, and that was she didn't want to take his last name. That's something that was really uncommon because at the time it was pretty much understood by everybody that when you get married, you take the guy's last name, but she just didn't want it. She didn't like it, so she decided that they both changed their last name to Windsor. And while writing this, Joshua emphasizes the fact that that is a powerful name. That is a name that you hear and you think somebody important is walking in, and that Eddie knew that when she picked it. She picked a strong and powerful name, and she is a strong and powerful woman. <laughs> Those are the first couple of chapters. I think that kind of covers her early life. It's actually June 22nd, and today is the one day out of this month that I'm skipping. I'm not posting anything because I know that this video is going to take a while, and I want to do it justice because I think it's interesting. So I'm allowing myself one night of leniency where I can focus fully on this video. I'll get back to you tonight with another update. What is what? The charger went away, so it has nothing to do with the TV cords or anything like that. No, they wouldn't have gone away. I don't, those cords don't throw away. In there, or it'll be upstairs in you guys' room. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I made it to the end of chapter 7, and then I started endlessly scrolling on TikTok, which I definitely should not have, but I figured if I'm not reading, I might as well update. Chapter 5 starts off by emphasizing that she decided to bury her feelings for women in search of stability, so she went to look for a good husband, a good life, follow that life path that people have. She married one of her brother's close friends, and at first, married life was easy. Everything just kind of fell into place. But one night, Caroline steps in and says, hey, is this really what you want? She admits that she's still cheating on her boyfriend. She's still going around with women, and she offers to have a little one-night thing since she's there. But Eddie pretends that her life is fine and satisfied and that everything is going just great, even though the marriage isn't really going that good. And unfortunately for her husband, this conversation was the first time that she had mentioned anything gay in quite a while, and it sort of reawakened that feeling. They ended up getting divorced after like six months together, and she fully embraced the idea that she is attracted to women, which felt like unlocking the secret to life. It felt like solving every equation. Every part of her fit together because now she has this identity that she can fully fit in with. And after coming to terms with that, she wanted to find a community that could accept that and could embrace that. So she moved in search of a gayer community and she immediately found one. She was introduced to the world of gay bars. Not all of them were friendly, but the idea was still comforting that there is a place out there where people similar to you can exist more freely. And it also emphasizes that she did still care deeply about her ex-husband. He ended up living a long, happy life. He was married for 50 years. He had kids. Like, he went off and he was fine and Eddie wanted to make sure that he was happy and protected and safe. There were no hard feelings between them. They very much still cared about each other. In 1951, she moved to New York in search of a new life. So she didn't bring her furniture. She was just completely starting fresh. For the first time ever, she went to a gay bar by herself. She got her first drink alone. She wrote, quote, This is what I've been waiting for. Laughter, friendship, dancing, smoking, and best of all, the promise of sex everywhere. I am so jealous when I read people's stories about their experiences in gay spaces. I love the idea of that community, and it's very frustrating to me that I don't really have anywhere like that that I can think of that I would go to. I mean, I guess the main place would be my work, because so many of my coworkers are queer, and it's honestly the best time. Because we all acknowledge it, we're all very aware of it, and it feels very comforting to be surrounded by like-minded people, but I just love reading about those experiences where people go and they feel so accepted in these spaces. And once she got more comfortable, she realized this is her place. This is the place that she wants to be. She confidently was approaching women. She was still a heartbreaker. She was still getting all these people
people who were all over her. The only thing was she still didn't know what she wanted to go to college for and what she wanted a career in. She had a couple of jobs, some that were a little bit sketchy. She found out that her old roommate, the first roommate that she had, ended up being gay and now she has a collection of gay male friends and she got to hang around with all of them and that also felt so comforting to read, to know how openly they accepted each other. And she ended up getting a job at NYU because they would give you free tuition so she finally got back into a path that had to do with math which is something she had always been passionate about. She wanted access to the computer but she was scared that she was gonna lose her privileges because somebody would find out that she's a lesbian. At the time there was the lavender scare which was just people being homophobic and she was scared that somehow people would dig it up, people would find it out and then they would banish her from the computers. But no, they didn't find it out. They were just scared of communism. Lots of things going on in this time of history. But she's finally comfortable in her identity. She's established a place that she can go to where other people are comfortable. And she has kind of an idea of a career path that she wants to follow. So things are looking good. I have a proposition. It's currently 1.30 a.m. on June 23rd. I wanted to post this video like eight hours ago, but I was like 20% through the book. There was no chance of that happening. And I was sitting there, I was suffering my way through it, and I thought, what if we do something else that we haven't done? What if we make this a two-part reading vlog? Currently, I'm on chapter 11. I am 49% through the book, and I am not feeling hopeful about being able to finish it and then edit all of this by tomorrow, which it's not even a really interesting reading vlog. It's not like I'm sitting here having these giant reactions. I'm just talking about information. So this is definitely more me focused, but the whole reason would be because I don't want this to be a chore. I think this book is really interesting. I think it's a really cool perspective to hear from and it's from somebody who was so influential, somebody who was so relevant in a time that we need to be talking about right now. And the last thing I want to do is feel like I have to read this book and like I have to drag my way through it. And if I read it for personal enjoyment, I feel like I may never get through it. Whereas if I have a video that's going on, then obviously I have to finish at some point. And it also motivates me to actually pay attention to the details and to be able to talk about it. I can try my best and I feel like with these videos it helps me understand it, it helps me remember it, it helps me pay attention to the things that are going on. All of this to say that I may be stopping the video after this update and then starting it up again to post tomorrow, purely for my own reading enjoyment. I feel like that will help me stay motivated to finish this book. As long as I remind myself that I don't have to know everything and that I'm not going to know everything, I'm not gonna understand all of this, I suck at history, but there's only one way to get better. Anyways, chapter 8. I got from chapter 8 to 11 just now. At this point in her life, she's post-college years, she's in her mid to late 20s. She's still telling her mom excuses about her love life, saying that she's just too busy to get into a relationship and that she's caring about all these other things. And because she's so successful with school and with her job and with whatever else, her mom kind of gives her a break and is like, yeah, okay, you focus on that. There was a lot of talk about her math job in that section, which I was kind of glazing over. I did not really know what was happening. And then something very, very unfortunate happened. Her dad went to visit her and had a little bit of a health scare. He ended up rushing to the hospital it was kind of a little bit of an emergency, but he stayed the night. They said he was okay. She came to visit the next day and went to head out to work. And pretty much the second she walked out of the hospital room, a bunch of nurses came rushing in and he passed away right then. And that is so unfortunate because moments before they had been talking and laughing and making it seem like everything would be okay. And she said, I really think I should wait until the rest of the family comes. And he said, no, it'll be fine. You can go. And obviously that's traumatizing for your child to be there while you're dying in the other room, but also the idea that he was alone. It would just suck to be in that position and to know that that was a possibility. I imagine there would be a lot of guilt that comes with that, even though obviously there's nothing you can do about that. Stuff just happens and you can't base your whole life around the what if. It did lead her to start thinking more about mortality and specifically what does she want to do with her life, both with her career and her love. And she did what she always does when she's going through a tough time. She threw herself fully into her work. Flash forward to New York, 1961. She was working more than she was socializing but she does still want to get back into queer communities because the gay group of guys that she had been with for a while kind of disbanded, they all went their own ways. So her social circle got smaller again. She's feeling a little bit lonely. There was a quote that I really liked. It said, along with the artsy crowds come the homosexuals. You got that right. She called up an old friend and they went to lesbian bars. They went back at it. This is where we introduce Thea. There's an immediate attraction between these two, but Thea's in a relationship at the time, so shouldn't really be pursued. 
she had a pretty wealthy family. It goes a little bit into her background about how she and her family escaped the Nazis and how they were very lucky and most people didn't have the opportunity to get out that they had. But the two of them are able to bond over both being Jewish and that whole background. They're both headstrong and smart and they're both a little bit of heartbreakers. They both had a lot of people after them. And there was this immediate attraction between the two of them, but because Thea was in a relationship, they couldn't act on it. But that didn't stop the little flirty comments and moments here and there. The gay scene was evolving. People weren't really accepting, but the gays weren't hiding as much either. This was a couple years before everything started to erupt and people were going all in with protests and everything like that, but this is just the beginning. You're starting to see people coming out into the world more, being more open with their expression, stuff like that. But Eddie didn't really want to be found out. She was very much focused on self-preservation, on keeping up this act of being straight just because that was the only way you would be accepted. She didn't want to sacrifice her own life to get that, which I think is fair because that's a big thing to jump into and that could completely change the entire path of your life. Obviously it's for the greater good, but it's still a hard decision to make. It's 1964, she's 35 years old and feeling lonely. For most people you would say that that's too old to still be a single woman, so she's feeling a little bit isolated. There was a brief period of time where she went to therapy to try and suppress these homosexual feelings. That went on for a little bit, which is sad to see, but it didn't last very long because the temptation of Thea was just too great. And pretty soon after that she was back on the path of girlfriend. <laughs> And then chapter 11 is where I kind of started to get bored because it's really repetitive, which I get it because that's how life goes. Reading about her getting a girlfriend and then deciding that she can't be with the girlfriend and then getting back with another one and then not doing it and then getting with a guy and then not and then I know that's all part of the process and I respect the process, but I'm a little tired of reading it at this point. That's a personal thing. I just, I've had enough of it. I don't have any notes from it. I was just so tired of writing the same thing over and over. The one thing to note in this chapter was that Thea is pretty unreliable as a partner. She was consistently going out with other women. She was canceling plans and then trying to remake them, saying, oh, I'll make it up to you. And even going as far as to suggest a threesome in Eddie's office at work, constantly pushing this boundary of what people would be okay with in a relationship. Eventually, Eddie gets pretty fed up with that behavior and says, no, we're done, we're not doing this because you're disrespecting me. So she cuts herself off completely for a while and Thea kind of has to come crawling on her knees begging to come back. And then they're head over heels in love. They are so attracted to each other. They're both really confident, strong women. They both have really bold personalities. They just play off of each other really well, even if sometimes that is a major cause for conflict. And that's as far as I've gotten as of right now. It's 1.42 on June 23rd. This is gonna become a two-part video entirely for my own sake, just so I have some reason to continue reading this book. Not because it's a bad book or an uninteresting story, but just because I'm tired. But it's okay because I'd rather have the full time to try and understand the story and to try and piece it all together and understand the significance than force myself to read through this entire book and rush through the story just so that I can put out a mediocre video. Instead of trying to put out a super informative video that is beneficial to the viewers, I'm gonna just try and make a video where I understand it and I enjoy it. I think that's the best way to go about this right now. It just makes more sense like this overall. And I don't need to explain it because it's my video and this is what I want to do. We don't need an outro. I'll see you tomorrow. We're gonna pick up right where we're leaving off. See you then. Bye.